many of us. Jonathan Pierce is a blogger, a teacher, a father of twins, that's why he looks so weary, um, a philosopher, and the author or editor of numerous brilliant books on topics of great interest to humanists and atheists. You'll see some of his books um, at the back there, and I'm sure they're available for sale, so I'll heartily, re heartily recommend your having a look at those before you leave this evening. He has given us countless talks already, and we keep asking him back, because everyone really touches on a nerve on some aspect of our humanist approach to life. So will you please give a very warm welcome to Jonathan. <laughs> So the other chap talking tonight, I don't know an awful lot about him, but um, you know he, he meddles in the humanist world and he does this and that for uh, humanism locally. Um, I think it's sort of probably a full-time job now, isn't it? <laughs> if you see his name cropping up, giving talks to the various different uh, organisations around here and travelling up to Salisbury and Southampton and Dorchester and uh, doing an absolutely brilliant job as our chairman. And we have it, the committee have actually um, instructed that he has to. Keep keep the chairman until he dies, so uh, I hope that you will um, uh, keep supporting him and keeping him healthy for us. Um, so the two of them are going to be debating Brexit, Brexit and democracy tonight, so we may have a few sparks flying by the end of the evening, but sparks are a little bits of light and enlightenment, uh, which is a very good thing. So who's going first? Well, my name's there, so I think you know who I am. Okay, um, well, I, it's lovely to see uh, you studying the handout, and uh, you're probably thinking, oh, there's quite a lot of economic stuff in there. I do want to tie this in with a little bit of economic history uh, of the 20th century, and I hope it will all kind of tie together um, by the end of my, my talk. So I'm going to talk for about uh, 20 minutes and then we'll, we'll hand over to Jonathan. Well, I'd like to uh, set the... I just want to make sure this is in the right place. If I stand here, is that picking it up okay? Yeah, okay. Well, I'd like to set the scene of my talk with a quotation first of all from Wolfgang Schäuble, who was the German Minister of Finance and a member of the Euro Group, which this is the committee that runs the Euro. And he is or was one of the most powerful finance ministers in Europe. And uh, this is what he said. Elections cannot be allowed to change economic policy. I just want... Uh, to let the implications of that sink in for a moment. Well, maybe you agree with him, um, but I think it's one of the most disturbing things I've ever heard, and it goes to the heart of why I think we were right to leave the European Union. So my three points, um, which are slightly polemical, um, are coming up. Why I believe it was right to vote leave. I believe that we should maintain democratic control over economic policy, unlike the European Union. Uh, I, the, the European Union is not a democracy. It's a crackpot Euro utopian project that's had its day. Very objective statement there, by the way. But, uh, but anyway, you can challenge me on all of this later on. And number three, the EU's economic ideology has caused economic ruin, and this is highly dangerous for the future of Europe. So nothing controversial there at all. Okay, well, let's... Um, the way I'm going to do this is run you through a quick overview of uh, 20th century economic history. So uh, don't worry. It, I've already been told it's a bit dry, but I hope it won't be too dry. Um, so well, let's start with the Wall Street crash. Um, and I'll just say we haven't got time to get bogged down in debates over particular points. Uh, I'm going to be making some, far, some quite broad brush statements as we go through. I hope they're broadly right, but you can challenge me in the Q&A. So starting from the Wall Street crash in 1929, broadly speaking, this was caused by exactly the same factors that caused the more recent financial crash in 2008 unregulated finance and a massive speculative bubble. 
Herbert Hoover, uh, the United States president, tried to impose a regime of austerity on the US economy, which led to the Great Depression. And Roosevelt took over in 1933, and he tried to sort out the Great Depression uh, with the New Deal, which was a program of infrastructure projects, airports, hospitals, schools, roads, bridges, and dams, and financial reforms. And in 1933, it included the enormously important Glass-Steagall Act, which separated commercial banking from speculative banking. And this created an effective firewall between commercial banking and the much more risky and speculative side of banking. The Glass-Steagall Act uh, was repealed in 1999 by Bill Clinton, and this was partly responsible for the 2008 crash. Meanwhile, in Europe, this man was elected Chancellor of Germany. Now, obviously, I'm not going to be able to give a full account of how and why this happened, but let's just say that economic austerity in Germany in the 1920s was partly responsible. In 1936, Keynes published his general theory, which laid the basis for the economic model which would follow the Second World War. And the Second World War effectively or decisively ended the Great Depression because of massive government spending and full employment. And just as a little uh, light relief, here's my mum uh, in the munitions factory in Westover Road. Uh, there she is there, and I'll blow her up for you. Uh, and they were known as the Glamour Girls. And uh, I'm not quite sure if that, that looks like a little beauty spot there. It's the sort of thing my mum probably would have done at that age. But uh, I don't think my mum thought too much about, you know, um, making armaments that were going to kill people. But anyway, she was in the... She did her bit for the war. Uh, so I wanted to... Uh, pay some tribute to her tonight. Okay, um, let's move on. Uh, the national debt peaked at around 250% of GDP, uh, much higher than now, of course. That, uh, where the red circle is, that's where G um, national debt peaked in the Second World War. Well, just before the end of the war, in 1944, the United Nations convened a conference in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, to try and create a stable international monetary system. Keynes, on the right-hand side there, was a key player, although he didn't get everything he wanted. The key outcome was that currencies would be pegged to the dollar, which itself would be pegged to gold. So it was a kind of de facto gold standard, money backed by gold. Okay, well, let's fast forward now to the Vietnam War. I can't go into all of the technical details, but the United States was spending so much money on the war and issuing so many dollars that its ability to convert dollars into gold was coming under strain. And in today's values, the war cost about a trillion dollars. So in 19, uh, 1971, Nixon suspended gold convertibility, which effectively ended the Bretton Woods system. And this meant that the pound became a free-floating currency. You can see it very clearly on this graph here. Uh, this is when the pound was a fixed exchange rate. There was a devaluation there in 1950. There was another devaluation in 1967 when James Callaghan was chancellor. And then in 1971, you see the pound just starts to float freely on the exchanges. Uh, now, there's a really important point coming up, so pay attention. I think you are all paying attention anyway. Since 1971, the pound has been a fiat currency. Now, what do we mean by the word fiat? Yeah, Angela, I know you said it's a, you said it's a car. You're quite right. But what does, <laughs> but what does the word fiat mean? A, la a good Latin word. Yes? It doesn't have anything back in it. It's just that everyone trusts its worth something. Nothing backing it, um, trusts its worth. Yeah, and, and it means let it be. Let it be, yes. Um, the good old Beatles song there. Yeah, well done, Simon. I think that's probably uh, the most accurate answer I've had. So you can pick up your prize at the end. I'm not sure what it is, but uh, we'll see what it is. Um, okay, so it means that the United Kingdom can never run out of money as long as we have our own central bank. So, um, yeah, so there we are. Key point, and I'll come back to this. Um, so don't worry about it, because you might think, oh, hang on a minute. Um, 
that's a controversial point. Oh, I hope you like the picture of the old pan, pan note there. And some of you are old enough to remember that. Um, so, since 1971, the pound has been a fiat currency, uh, and the UK can never run out of money. Okay, I will come back to that. Right. Um, in 1973, oil prices were dramatically increased by the oil-producing countries OPEC, and this stoked inflation around the world. The price of oil quadrupled from $3 to $12 a barrel. You can see that on the red line there. That's going up from $3, uh, well, $4 to $10 on, on there, but it, it quadrupled, basically. So inflation was going through the roof, and this led to union militancy, a minor strike, I've already sp spoken to uh, John about this this evening, um, and um, a minor strike, two general elections, and a new Labour government. So there we are, 1973, oil prices went up, 1974 we had two general elections. I remember it well, uh, we had a kind of mock election at school, I was a bit too young at that point to vote. Okay, uh, so then what happened? Um, in March 1976, the pound began to slide against the dollar. And this was a market reaction to left-wing politicians in the Labour government who were trying to resist government spending cuts. How could they possibly do such a thing? But anyway, there we are. There was a, a market reaction to that. And in September 1976, Jim Callaghan, Prime Minister at the time, announced his conversion to the politics of austerity, which, with which we've become very familiar. And he said this, you can't spend your way out of a crisis. And uh, you may remember that in December 1976, Dennis Healy applied to the IMF for a, a loan of nearly $4 billion, and the IMF imposed austerity conditions uh, on Britain, which eventually led to the winter of discontent and the election of Margaret Thatcher. Now there's a key question coming up, so do pay attention again. Um, so here's the question, did Callaghan and Healy really need to go to the International Mon Monetary Fund for a loan and impose austerity on Britain? Well my answer to that is no, because the UK can never run out of money. They could have continued with government spending and left sterling to find its own level on the currency markets. Well, you may be sceptical uh, skeptical about this, but the proof is in something called quantitative easing, which you may have heard of, which has been a money creation scheme practiced by the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of Japan to the tune of trillions of dollars. Uh, let's, I'll go past him for a minute. Um, so there we are, there's a nice bit of Latin for you. I always like to throw in a bit of Latin or Greek for your edification. Fiat Luca lucrative, lucre, money, let there be money. So Bank of England has created 400 billion of fiat money with QE, Federal Reserve 4.5 trillion, the European Central Bank 2.5 trillion, the Bank of Japan 35 trillion yen. And none of this adds a penny or a cent to the national debt and none of it has caused consumer price inflation. Okay, still keeping up? Yeah, just about. Um, so, where am I? Um, well, many economists are now calling for quantitative easing to be redirected into the real economy. And this is someti sometimes called OMF, which you may not have heard of unless you're a technical um, economist, overt monetary financing, or more popularly, which you may have heard of, people's QE. It would enable the government to invest in the real economy without adding a penny to the national debt. Many economists, including Steve Keen and Anne Pettifor, are now calling for this kind of approach. And a version of it was proposed in the last Labour manifesto, a national investment bank with £200 billion of fiat money. Some people have a phobic reaction to this because they instantly fear that it would lead to more debt or inflation or even hyperinflation. Well, I'll just respond briefly to this by quoting uh, a few economists. This is Olivier Blanchard, former chief economist at the IMF, and he said this, the government can do something that neither you nor I can do. With the central bank's cooperation, the government can, in effect, finance itself by money creation. 
This is Brian Lucy, Professor of Finance uh, in Dublin, and he said this, in the past, monetary financing was dismissed by many because of the highly inflationary risk such policy entails. But right now, such risk is close to zero. The effects of QE for people could be closely monitored by central banks and adjusted if necessary. And finally, let's, let's quote uh, a German uh, economist, president of the Deutsche uh, Bundesbank, um, and he said this, I put it in bold so you don't forget it, central banks can create money out of thin air. Okay, so, so why did um, Dennis Healy go to cap in hand to the IMF in 1976? Well, probably the best explanation of this is that Milton Friedman and his monetarist theories have become newly fashionable. This is Milton Friedman, a uh, Chicago economist, and uh, his monetarist theory is that you just need to choke off the money supply in order to curb inflation. Well, there's an element of truth in this, but the money supply doesn't cause inflation by itself. You only get inflation when there's too much money relative to the production, productive capacity of the economy. And this is why we have, uh, why we've got inflation in the housing market, because there's too much money chasing too few houses. So the really a big and uh, fascinating story here is that Thatcherism began a full three years before Thatcher. So the next big historical question is this. Oh, there we are. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm saying on there, monetarism caused austerity, which caused the winter of discontent, which led to the election of Margaret Thatcher. So um, there she is. Um, so the the big historical question, which you all came here for to find the answer tonight. What she got in her handbag? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing at all. Lead weight. A lead weight? <laughs> Should have been a gold for five. I know that man at the back, Steve, has just walked in. I'm sure you know who, what she's got in her handbag, Steve. No, I have no idea. Ah, oh, there you are, you see. The man who knows. Mm. So this is what she had in her handbag. Um, a book called The Constitution of Liberty by Friedrich Hayek, an Austrian economist who taught at the London School of Economics. And along with Milton Friedman, Hayek was one of the chief architects or priests, if I say priests, of neoliberalism. So from 1979, we get neoliberalism with a vengeance. And I'm going to explain what that is, because it's a, a word that gets bandied about. Um, we just need to know what we mean by it. You can call it Thatcherism, if you like. Um, neoliberalism, in brief, is privatization. You probably remember those privatizations uh, back in the 1980s. Deregulation, especially finance. Globalization, so manufacturing transferred abroad. Allow unemployment to rise, don't interfere with the market. Um, clamp down on the unions, which uh, keeps John happy, uh, John Glazer there. Um, and uh, austerity, impose austerity and welfare cuts. Well, we're now 40 years into the neoliberal era, so let's have a look at the pros and cons. Um, oh, there's one more there. You depoliticise economic decision making. So the Bank of England independence was, a, was an expression of that, which was brought in by Gordon Brown, you'll, you'll remember. Well, that's a really important point, that, that neoliberalism has this idea that economic decision making should just be left to the experts, leave, leave it to the technical experts, depoliticise it, as we saw at the, the beginning, um, Wolfgang Schäuble saying, you know, don't let uh, elections interfere with economic decision making. Well, let's have a look at uh, the pros and cons of neoliberalism then. There are some pros, I think. You could argue there's greater efficiency, more responsive to customer needs, uh, cheaper goods from abroad, lower inflation, fewer strikes, lower taxes, especially if you are rich. But there are some cons, and I've left a bit more room for the cons <laughs> side. Uh, higher unemployment, greater inequality, more frequent financial crashes. There's no long-term planning really being done by governments who follow this neoliberal dogma because they, don't, they, because they believe in, in government stepping back really. 
unresponsive or re relatively unresponsive to environmental problems, those are called externalities, uh, political and media capture by wealthy elites, and it seeks to insulate itself from democratic process. Again, we're talking tonight about democracy and the European Union, which I will come back to in just a moment, don't worry, I'm not doing the wrong talk here. Um, everything driven by market values, including education, which I think you, you may agree is uh, not being the best thing for education. Uh, no such thing as society, that good old quotation from Margaret Thatcher, which was ripped out of context, but I'll stick it up there anyway. Um, permanent austerity, particularly in certain <coughs> countries in Europe, uh, leading to xenophobia, leading to resur resurgent fascism, and even, I chucked in Donald Trump at the end there as well, just, just for good measure. You can, you can disagree with any of these if you like, uh, after I've stopped rattling on. So let's come back to the European Union. You'd be probably thinking, when's he going to get back to the European Union? Let's have a look at some pros and cons of the European Union then, just to be nice and balanced. There are some pros. Frictionless trade across borders. I love that phrase, frictionless. Um, our biggest trading partner, uh, cooperation in many other areas, such as science and environment, uh, power to regulate capitalism and uphold workers' rights. Whether it's actually used or not, I don't know, but uh, they have that power, arguably. And there, are, there is some democratic oversight. You know, we do have a European Parliament and a Council of Ministers. But I'm going to now say that there are some uh, cons on the uh, disadvantages side. The European Union is not a democracy. It can't be because it's not a country. Um, it's been trying to become a country for many, many years, decades, you could say. But it's not a country, so it can't be a democracy. It is a, essentially, it's a bureaucracy with some, a, a little bit of democratic, uh, some, say, some people say a, a democratic veneer. Um, and this is the really important point, uh, and this is why I've been banging on about neoliberalism, because neoliberalism uh, was hardwired into the European Union with the Treaty of Maastricht in 1992. So essentially, it's there, it can't really be changed, unless, there's a, uh, you know, unless the treaties are actually ripped up and start again. The euro removes democratic control over national economies and hands it to the European Central Bank. We had a really near miss with this. Um, Tony Blair, I mean, he was on the radio this morning. Um, Tony Blair wanted to take us into the Euro. Um, it would have been a catastrophe for this country if, we, if that had happened. Uh, Gordon Brown actually was the decisive factor and stopped Tony Blair from doing that. Um, and it essentially gives up this power that we have, a central bank, and hands it to the European Central Bank, which is totally unaccountable um, and answerable to no one really except itself. The debt crisis uh, in, uh, in Europe has transferred wealth from ordinary people to banks, uh, and these three organisations, the European Union, the, the European Central Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, sometimes known as the Troika, they have crushed democracy in Greece. And if there's a little bit of anger coming into my voice, it's because I'm very, very angry about what happened to Greece, and I can't really forgive the European Union for that. There's massive unemployment in the Eurozone, uh, particularly in Greece, uh, and particularly for young people. It's been an absolute disaster for young people uh, in many parts of Europe. Um, and there's this idea now of permanent austerity in certain countries, and really dangerously resurgent fascism. So, why do I believe it was right to vote Leave? I believe that we should maintain democratic control over economic policy, unlike the European Union, which tries to insulate economic policy from democratic process, and it's got its economic ideology written into the treaty so that it essentially can't be changed. The European Union is not a democracy. It's a crackpot utopian project that's had its day. I mean, I say that because really it's, it, it, it's um, something that comes or belongs to the Cold War era. It's a kind of European version of the Soviet Union. Obviously, there are massive differences, but it's the same kind of idea, trying to get 20, 28 countries together. It's utopian, it's crackpot, it will fall apart. 
and the, EU, the EU's economic ideology has caused economic ruin, and this is highly dangerous for the future of Europe. So my conclusion is that the UK can decide democratically to move beyond neoliberalism because we have the ultimate weapon, we have a fiat currency, which means that we can never run out of money. Thank you very much. So we're just going to uh, swap over the um, laptops, so if you just bear with us for a moment. I'm not going to win this because I didn't bring anything to my heart. Uh, <laughs> probably a good thing. Uh, I've got my own clicker, but yours I think will be better, so I'll happily use your clicker. It's on the back, I think. Yeah, that one. And if you've got a uh, USB, stick that in a USB. Can you talk politely amongst yourselves? Should. Is, what do I press? Just on, yeah, just the one just on the right. On the right, okay. So, can you hear me all right? Um, wow, it turns out that I think we agree on heaps to do with neoliberalism. I have written blog posts longer than your arm on attacking free market economics, but I wasn't expecting to come in here and talk about that tonight. So I have plenty to say on it, and disagreeing obviously with, with some of your conclusions there, but I, I won't go into that, I'll, I'll talk about my stuff first, obviously. So I'll start with a bit of Winston Churchill, um, just because uh, he said the best argument against democracy was a five minute conversation with the average voter. And uh, I would agree with that in terms of uh, the EU referendum, I think, but there you go. Um, so, uh, has Brexit represented a win for democracy? In short, no. We have a representative de democracy whereby we democratically vote for a local MP to represent us in Parliament by voting on issues on our behalf. Issues that are often too complex to become, for us to become experts in any meaningful way. We voted for MPs who overwhelmingly supported Remain uh, and the referendum was only an advisory referendum in the EU refer it, it, uh, about the EU. So if we're talking about uh, representative democracy. I think I think we we missed it. we missed something there. And being advisory only at the beginning, I think there were heaps of issues with that. It was not legally binding, and the government have taken it to be so. Uh, one of the most important variables that contributes to making sound decisions is information. So uh, that would be good information. And this seems to have been in short supply over the referendum period. This can be partly explained by um, having a, an appeal to the, an unknown future, right? We were making predictions about what would happen after the referendum. And so everyone's just picking numbers out of their posteriors or, or, or going to their own experts. And of course, it becomes very difficult when you're making claims about the future that you don't know. Um, but there was also a large impact of misinformation. We live in a society that is controlled by the media. For example, there are some eight or so right-wing newspapers, the Sun, the Times, the Daily Mail, the Express, the Telegraph, the Evening Standard, the Financial Times, and there are only two left-wing newspapers, the Guardian and the Mirror. Just two individuals, Rupert Murdoch and Lord Rodemere, controlled a staggering 52.2% of online and print national news publications in the UK in 2013. And over three quarters, 77.8% of the press, is owned by a handful of billionaires. If you add up the readership of these right-wing newspapers, they account, and this is just in print, they account for a staggering 69% of national newspaper readership in Britain in 2013. Of course, with the Daily Mail, uh, the News Online, uh, Mail Online being the largest or well, the most read news outlet online, you know, those figures would be would swing even more in that favour. The Press Gazette research has found that over the last 28 days of the campaign, around 90 million newspapers were printed with pro-leave front pages versus only 30 million with pro-remain. So, so the impact of the media is huge. It's, it's, it was really controlling the discourse. Um, 
the founder of fact-checking website Breaking Views, claimed that the series of significantly misleading articles misled the British public when they voted to leave the EU. He also claimed that press regulator, the independent press standards organisation, failed to deal with the misleading stories adequately. He said corrections were insignificant compared with often front page prominence for the original stories. And he said that the most of the 19 complaints that still rem uh, that, that, that he had lodged uh, were not dealt with until after the referendum. You could argue that this is free market economics, right? That these organisations are giving the people what they want. Um, but, but they prey on fear and a psychology of, of people um, at the expense of rational evidence. I know for a fact this happened with my own family. I had very many vociferous arguments and debates. Um, my own father is not here, so uh, he can't argue against this. Um, but he, he came to me at the barbecue and he said, oh, this is terrible, um, we're going to leave the EU, these Albanians, there's this Albanian murderer, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he's referring to his Daily Mail article. So I went away that day and I researched the article. And the article, front page of the Daily Mail, was about this um, Albanian who'd been in the country 18 years and was a murderer and blah, blah, blah. Of course, Albania isn't part of the Schengen Agreement, not part of the EU. He'd been here 18 years anyway, so it's nothing to do with the EU referendum, and he was an illegal immigrant. So it, literally every part of that article had nothing to do with the EU debate, but it fed into the psychology of the people reading that to be staunchly anti-EU, and I saw that in my own family. Um, so what should be scary to you all now is that just the other week, the government narrowly voted down the second part of the Levson inquiry. The Sun's headline was House of Sore Losers, Peers trying to muzzle the press just days after MPs voted down second Leveson inquiry. And that's, of course, because the Leveson inquiry would have impacted the sun itself. So they were dead happy about that. Um, and now they're anti the, the House of Lords, partly because they voted down some Brexit legislation and partly because they voted down the Leveson inquiry. Um, so... Uh, and of course that got voted down in the House of Commons because the government had done a deal with the DUP through some bribery. So they just got the Leveson inquiry, for the second Leveson inquiry voted down. The thing is, um, it looked to deal with the issues of, of press power and, and misinformation and uh, the, the sort of um, ethical things that they do or don't do. Um, and the results of the first level inquiry haven't even been properly implemented, uh, largely due to the present government. So, you know, we, we talk about having a, a fully functioning democracy, but the information that we're being given to make, make our own democratic choices are often, you know, really compromised. What I'm trying to say is the EU debate was not one about democracy, but one about who controls and disseminates the information. I would argue that the EU was never a worry for the vast majority of British people until it became a worry because it was artificially generated, and this coincided with issues of, or perceived issues of immigration. All along, I've argued that the whole thing was better seen as a referendum on immigration. Everything else was what's called post hoc rationalisation, which means you make a decision, so you feel really strongly about immigration. I saw this with my own family. Uh, but then you say, right, I need to defend that immigration stance by looking for lots of other arguments. Sovereignty. Suddenly, sovereignty became really important. Um, and this is a real problem, because three years before that, sovereignty, no one cared about it. No one cared about sovereignty in the EU three years before. The EU debate came up, referendum, and suddenly a massive thing. And, and I just find that really strange, because if it was a massive thing, it should have been a massive thing three years before. Now, I know, uh, so if the public were genuinely interested, in fact, I'm going to show you a, a, a slide here. So, what gives me the little red button? Uh, in the middle. In the middle. Ooh! Ah. So, here we have a press sort of bias, or, uh, or you could argue the press, um, who their consumers are. So at the moment we're largely blue, very tiny amount of Labour, a bit of Lib Dem, and that's actually mainly UKIP uh, there. So largely uh, supporting the, uh, the political right. This is really interesting. So the Daily Mirror, so you've got, three, you've got two left-wing newspapers, very small readership. Daily Mirror was also the paper with the fewest EU articles, EU referendum articles. And that's largely because they have a very working class readership who weren't particularly interested or they knew would probably vote Leave. The Guardian and the Financial Times, with their small readership, are due to all, from all surveys we know, are basically the most reliable newspapers in print. Uh, 
you can argue that if you want, you won't get very far. They, they, these are the least reliable, but they have the highest readership. Uh, that's particularly unreliable, but luckily it has a slightly lower readership, and then you have, you know, in the middle. But these are actually going, I haven't seen the Daily Telegraph go more right wing over the years, to be honest. Um, but there you go. It's just an, really interesting, the readership of the right-wing newspapers plus the Financial Times. Now, what's interesting is these two are seen as the most reliable newspapers in Britain, and they were the two Remain newspapers. Which, which you may laugh, but, but the surveys show that they are the most reliable. So, so the stats would show that these are the most reliable. For, uh, Guardian's won you know, a good deal of, of Pulitzer Prize, uh, 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 journal, investigative journalism awards. They, if, so here's an analogy, if I was to say to you, you need to vote on X, you know nothing about that X, you're going to vote either A or B on X. One thing you want to know is who, who else is going to vote A and who's going to vote B. Which newspapers would support A? Would it be the most reliable newspapers or the least reliable newspapers? Would it be the newspapers with the worst um, reputation or the newspapers with the best reputation? Now that's not going to tell you truth, right? But it's a guide, it's a guide, and I think it's quite an interesting guide. Um, up here, uh, most of the messages were uh, negative in, in, across the news. Factual, uh, unfortunately, was only sort of 33%. Um, this is interesting, so no one cared about the EU until they cared about the EU. Uh, and that coincided with issues about immigration. So immigration kicks up, issues with the EU kick up. So really, in my opinion, it was, and that's not to say there, are not, there aren't or weren't issues with immigration, right? I'm not saying, oh, immigration is wonderful, it's lovely, we should support it a lot. This is a really complex, nuanced debate. But don't fool yourself by looking for other arguments when really what's driving your arguments in immigration. Don't dress it up. Be honest and say, it's immigration. Then we can have a debate on immigration alone. Don't come to me and say it's all about sovereignty. Because if you're worried about sovereignty, right, where were you during the AV referendum? So I campaigned for, for AV, which is your time to vote, because our dem democratic system is, so you're saying the EU's not a great democratic system, it actually has far better voting systems than we do in this country. So if you're worried about the dem democratic values of the EU, we have first past the post. Now, if you support UKIP, you, four million people voted UKIP, how many MPs did you get? One. Is that representative democracy? No, because our system's broken. But all the people who voted leave, and I, well, okay, all the people I've ever spoken to who voted leave, voted no for the, for the alternative vote. If they were interested in sovereignty and democratic values, they would have voted, they would be against the House of Lords, they would be against the Queen, and they would be against um, first past the post as being the worst form of democracy. There's the only countries that have first past the post are Britain and all its ex-colonies. If any new country is made, any new country in the last 50 years has been created, not one of them has taken out first past the post. So, is the EU broken? Arguably it's less broken than Britain. Um, so, going forward, what do we say about democracy? Well, anyone who I, I, if you want first past the post explained, I can probably do that a bit later in, in the Q&A, but it, uh, I'll probably leave that for now, but I will explain it, because it's really important. Um, so, going forward, what can we say about democracy? Well, anyone who voted Leave is, um, is so it is claimed, interested in democracy and sovereignty and self-determination. By extension, then, uh, they should be all, all uh, good and well behind Scottish independence and Welsh independence. Heck, where is the line of demarcation? Should you not allow self-determination of any entity that wants it? Cornwall, Yorkshire. It's difficult to establish a line around the UK coast, but not within it. After all, uh, that line is merely an accident of history, as, as are all lines of national demarcation. We are humans. We like to draw lines in the sand, but we're humans. For me, the future challenges are those of international collaboration. I'm an internationalist and in this regard. I feel really strongly about this, and I don't want to continue to see the regression into nationalist politics that we have seen in the UK, and we are seeing in Poland and Hungary. And what's interesting is those nationalists, uh, David talked about the rise of fascism, that is against the EU. 
Those fascist groups are anti-EU groups, and they are arising through national democracies. So I don't know that you could bring that into being the fault of the EU at all. Um, I said, uh, so we, uh, so progressive collaborative politics is being shunned in favour of shrinking back into our tribal domains. We won't solve international problems without working together internationally. I suggest that we expect certain uh, characteristics to be present in the structure of any liberal democracy. They should be representative, transparent and accountable. If these characteristics are present in the democratic institutions, uh, they will normally enjoy legitimacy and authority. And I will say that the EU actually has all three. The EU is representative more so than N many national parliaments, including Britain's. The European Parliament is made up of MEPs from all 28 member states, each elected using various forms of proportional representation, unlike the House of Commons, which is elected through a widely criticised first-past-the-post system. The Euro European Commission itself is made up of civil servants recruited from the member states, experts in their areas. The Parliament is transparent enough. Uh, Commission civil servants have been found to be much more open to inquiries than those working in the, in the British government. What about uh, the claims of democracy for, from the other side? Well, the remedy mostly lies with national parliaments. It could and should be their job to call their own government ministers over in Brussels to account for what they do in Brussels. But most national parliaments do a very poor job at the, in this regard, the House of Commons being one of these poor performers. So if you're talking about it being undemocratic, we can hold those people to account. We just don't. Another difficulty with ensuring accountability is that in the absence of significant Europe-wide print or broadcast media, it's up to the national press and broadcasters to fill the public in on what goes on in Brussels. And once again, we do a really bad job of that. Um, so, but there are opportunities for direct citizen involvement in EU matters. Citizens can lobby their own MEPs or all MEPs if they wish. And it is often individual complaints from citizens that lead to groundbreaking legal judgments in the European Court of Justice. If an EU-wide petition attracts one million signatures from across the range of countries, the European Commission must bring proposals about that subject before the European Parliament. The European Ombudsman also helps individuals pursue grievances which might involve maladministration by the EU officials. So it is accountable. The verdict, clearly the EU structure has defects. It does have defects. I'm not painting it, you know, I don't believe it's perfect. But we would have changed it from within. Has defects when assessed by the normal standards of Western democracy, but I would argue that the British Parliament with its unelected House of Lords and an unrepresented House of Commons and an unelected Head of State um, in terms of the balance of political parties to folks cast is even less democratic. Eurosceptics have a long time questioned the legitimacy of the EU, but that charge is difficult to sustain. Of course, national parliaments have all agreed to pull sovereignty in the EU institutions, but they are entitled to do that and have done so with their eyes wide open. Many even ask their citizens to vote on the decision in a referendum. What's more, national governments, through the Council of Ministers, are still the most powerful collective influence in shaping EU decisions, not the European Parliament. They have the right to raise a yellow card about EU legislation, which can cause the Commission to change it. EU's in the process at the moment of strengthening the ability of national parliaments to call a halt to EU legislation if they object to it. So all in all, the EU is, or at least working to be, a democratic organisation. It has its failings, but national governments have just as many, if not more. And just to finish up, a little bit on neoliberalism. So, with high levels of social protection, state-owned rail companies, nationalised utilities and banks, various price controls and industrial interventions, the European continent does not, on the face of it, look like the neoliberal hellhole of the leftist, leftist imagination. So actually, here is someone on the left, I think probably, politically on the left, attacking the EU, which is actually absolutely legitimate, on account of it being neoliberalist. But What's interesting is, if I ask any Brexiteer here, what's your problem with the, the, with the EU? Regulation would be one of the top ones. So regulation is the opposite of neoliberalism. That is where the government says, you're going to do this, you're going to do this. And the reason they do it, I could go back and refer to, to uh, David's PowerPoint, he mentioned something called externalities. That is super, super important. I can explain that later. But basically, the only way, I'll, I'll explain it now. If a company is making a good, right, and it pollutes a river, 
That is a, the cost of that polluted river is in the cost of cleaning it, right? And the cost to the environment and the cost to death of animals. So the cost of cleaning it falls on the taxpayer because the taxpayer pays for the government to go and clean that river. So the company make their good, they make a load of profit, but they don't have to clean the river. So what happens? They get fines. So who steps in to fine them? The government. Who does that? Regulation through the government, which is the opposite of neoliberalism, which is let companies do what they want and let the market, it's what's called free market economics, let the market deal with that. The market cannot deal with what are called negative externalities, health and the environment being the two biggest ones. What the EU does superbly, absolutely superbly, and has done since we've been in it, is regulate for the environment. We had two beaches that you could swim off back in the 70s. We now have virtually every beach getting blue flat, or, you know, doing exceptionally well. And the only reason we do is through EU legislation. And a neoliberalist organisation couldn't do that. If it was truly Van Hayek is a really, really massive free market thinker, or was, he would absolutely turn in his grave to think of the EU being neoliberalist and yet have all that regulation. You can't have your cake and eat it. You can't say, you can't complain about the EU for having regulation and then complain about it for being ne neoliberal. Those two are direct contradictions. So I would just bring that up because I think that's super important. Um, so. Europe actually seems to be a collection of social democracies and what has been described by economists as a coordinated market econo economies. So it's like a mix, it's a mixture. And that's why there are contradictions in the EU. And that's why there are these issues. Because actually it's a mixture of a bit of neoliberalism and the state deciding what you can and can't do. So just to finish, it seems farcical that Brexiteers on the left criticise the EU with all its employment and environmental legislation and seek to go it alone with the World Trade Organisation in the open market, where, where basically, and I will leave you with this example, how do we attract businesses to this country? So if you have a company that wants to set up here, and it wants to maximise its profits. It can set up here and access 70 million people, or it can go to Europe and access 500 million people freely. How do we attract them here? Has anyone got an idea of how we attract that, that company to come here and not go to Europe? Lower Cheap labour. Cheap labour. Lower tax. Lower tax. No regulation. Health and safety. Environment. Do what you like to it. The only way, and this is happening in farming as well, so we will have to deregulate farming, which means we'll start polluting land because we will have to compete with Europe to, bring, uh, to make our goods look more attractive. And the only way you do that is to make our goods cheaper or the production of the goods cheaper. And the only way you do that is lowering tax, lowering regulation, health and safety, environment. This is exactly what I argued when we had a panel debate before. And this is what is happening. It's literally what's happening. You, you, you don't have, our companies do not have the choice but to do that because they cannot compete on a, on, a, on a global scale with multinationals who are accessing 500 million people. Anyway, the, uh, I have loads more to say about loads of his points, but that will come as, it, uh, as we move on. Thank you very much for listening. I even have more pretty pictures, but you know, whatever. <laughs> questions. Um, can I have a volunteer, someone to carry a mic around? Oh, thank you very much indeed. Well, no, actually, firstly, we're going to just have a little bit of oh, a punch-up. Oh, right. And then, <laughs> and then we'll, uh, right, get sorry. Okay. Okay. And, then, and then we'll bring in uh, someone else. Yeah. Uh, right. Oh, this is working nicely, isn't it? Now, Jonathan, um, do you want to go back to that mic, or do you want to have the yellow mic? Or do you, oh, is this one working? Well, it, you need it all, but I'll happily stand it. Okay. It's no problem. Okay. Um, shall I respond to one or two of your points, first of all? Um, I mean, there are loads of points I'd like to respond to, but um, that's going to take too long, because we've only got ten minutes. I really would like to pick up on 
Um, certainly this idea that you were putting forward that the U European Union is less broken democratically than the UK. In some, so, in, in some way. In, in some respects, okay. And you were saying that the European Parliament is more representative because you're making quite a big thing of, of proportional representation, etc. Yeah, etc. Et and you said it is a democratic organisation, yeah? It has democratic systems. Yeah, yeah okay. It depends how you define these things. Okay. Well, I would, just, I would just counter that by saying, uh, yeah, in some respects it, it, it has some elements of democracy, and you're right to say, it's, you could say it's a democratic organisation. However, the European Union is not a democracy, because it is not a country. I mean, it is essentially, it is a, it is a supranational bureaucracy. Um, and there is nothing that the people of Europe can do to get rid of it or change its direction or boot out the commission or anything like that so it so it is not a democracy and that was that was my key point and whatever you say about you know the uk democracy and and the pr in the european parliament doesn't change that basic point i don't know if you want to come back on that well i, th I think it does change that basic point because i think if you're attacking another institution for being and this is potentially what's called the two court crate fallacy. But if you're attacking another institution for not having these values and then so that saying we're going to retreat to our own national um, mechanisms and systems, but those have arguably less democratic values in the, in the systems that you use than the one you're attacking, then I think you've got a bit of a problem. But I, <laughs> but, I think that's a very I, point. Well, I, I think that's a very poor point because the UK is a democracy okay yeah we got it we've got a hereditary monarchy we've got House of Lords and all the rest of it we've got first past the post but we can boot out the executive whenever we want to every five years we can get rid of them and we can change direction that is but we can vote out our MEPs yes but that does not change anything about the European Union. But it, it does. They're no. part of the. They are part of the decision-making process. I don't think you can just blithely say that they that changes nothing because actually the decision-making process is yes, there are different organisations, but one of them is the group of MEPs. Now, if you are voting out certain MEPs, so you have collectives of of similar-minded MEPs in Europe who, who will join groups who will then try and in, in influence decisions. Because if I vote for a Lib Dem MEP, I would expect those Lib Dem values to be taken to Europe and, and spread in the decisions that my MEP is making. Right? So I don't see how that is not... I don't see how that is completely not democratic. It's an, it's, <laughs> there's an element of democracy there, but I, I, you know, I, we're probably not going to agree on this unless we do the arm wrestling test. Um, but you know, I, I don't think that that doesn't change the basic direction of the European Union because the European Union is run by, by treaties um, and it's going in one direction. I mean, it's, it's stalled, you could say it's stalled now. Um, I mean, the Commission basically comes up with all the ideas. It's, it's like, it's, it's as if we had the civil service in charge here and the, and the House of Commons just does a little bit of tinkering. I'll tell you what, I work in education and if you had, if you had educationalists in charge of our education system, it would be a bloody sight better than having our politicians in charge of it. So that's, that's so, you know, hands up, big up the civil servants because actually, you know, I mean, I probably agree with you on that. Yeah, <laughs> it's ex experts doing things in. Every, I mean, I think is it is it? Oh, which country is it? Uh, one of the European countries is Holland. I think the Netherlands. I think when they vote for their parliament, when they vote in the general elections, they get the um, they get their parliament in charge, and then the parliament chooses uh, ministers for for. So they'll go into you know the. Uh, the justice minister will be no party, complete non-partisan and unaffiliated, and will be a civil ser or someone who has absolute expertise in justice, who has the ability and is the best person for the job, and they elect that person to do to do that job. And actually, so so I think we 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 hold up democracy, this idea that I vote for someone, they get in, that's perfect, as being the perfect system. But actually, there are loads of other systems that 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 have advantages over that democracy. And especially if you've got first past the post.
Okay, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying it, it's perfect at all. I mean, on the, on the point of, of experts, I mean, the really, the really worrying aspect here is when we start talking about economics. Because we're all beginning to realise now that economics is actually a branch of theology. So you can have, you can have as much expertise as you like in economics, but it's still effing nonsense, uh, most economics as it's taught and practiced uh, globally because it's, it's been taken over by neoliberalism. So, um, you know, that's, that's the kind of problem with experts that we have in the European Union. Well, I, I think things get polemic. So, so neoliberalism is on, on this side and communism on this side, right? And Britain has, over the last 50 years, sat nicely in the middle in what econo economists call a mixed economy. We have a mixed economy, which is, yeah, we let the capitalism do a bit of work, but we rein it in when it gets a bit crazy, right? And actually, I think that's broadly what the EU is, which has neoliberalist tendencies, which is capitalism is the only system that's shown to work and give growth. But it's also unfettered, it's really dangerous and leads to massive inequalities. So, so you need to have the ideas of capitalism working to drive the economies, but then you need to rein it in when necessary. And I think the EU does an excellent job of reining in the, the, uh, a lot of those, uh, those overtly neoliberalist tendencies. Now, there will be people in the EU who are overtly neoliberalist, and there will be people who are on the other side of that, because it's made up of elected officials who hold those positions. And if you vote uh, for your MEPs, all of your MEPs who are on the, on the right-hand side of the political spectrum, who, who believe capitalism is a way forward, you will get an EU that reflects that. Okay, I'm going to agree with you on a, a little bit of what you said, because, I mean, you were saying that the EU regulates superbly for the environment example. I mean, I'm not going to disagree with things like that. And you were saying that that's kind of an argument against the EU being ne neoliberal. I agree, you know, that the, that the European Union is not pure neoliberalism because, yeah, obviously it's, it's, it's regulating and I think I can go along with that. I'm wondering if we can, because we're short of time in our, our little sort of tete-a-tete -tete here, Jonathan, if I can move on to one or two other areas. Um, I mean, you said in your speech that I'm an internationalist and that we need to work together. I agree absolutely. But, you know, the word international requires us to have nations. <laughs> you know, so there's kind of contradiction in what you're saying. Um, you know, we can't be international unless we have nations. So, you know, yeah. so we, we shouldn't be dissing nations and saying, well, let's get rid of nations and just have a super, supranational organisation bureaucracy running things from Brussels by these so-called experts. Um, that, that's, do, doing, that's doing away with nations. But we do have nations. I mean, that's being descriptive. I'm internationalist because presently we have nations. Right? I'm not saying... I don't believe in nations, uh, and then, and then, right, let's, no, I have to work with what we've got. We've, what we've got is nations, and I believe we should work really closely with each other, collaborate, and actually form moral laws. Regulations are moral laws, right? So, so I'm, I'm a big fan of that. However, when I think, when I get my real philosopher's hat on and think to the future, and think, what will the world look like in 10,000 years? I don't think it will look like a collection of small nations. And I'm not sure, you see, we like tradition, right? And so you think of identity, this is all about identity. Remain, Ramonas, they're a group there, Brexiteers are a group there, and everyone hates each other, we draw a line in the sand, Rah. It's identity, we go tribal, and all nationhood is, is, a, is a, an extended form of tribalism. Uh, so maybe because that's ingrained in humanity, maybe that will prevail over time. But I think really going forward, you'll have one, a one world order of some variety because that is the only way you will solve global problems. I, I don't want to live in that world, Jonathan. That sounds absolutely horrifying. No. A one, well, one world order is basically a totalitarian state. No, it's not. No, 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 no. I did not say that at all. But that's what it would be. We have a one nation order here. Is it totalitarian? No, because... Well, what's the difference? Or it's just orders of magnitude. I d that, that, that is not fair. No, it's, it's too big. It's too big. Democracy works at the... I mean, it is about size. Size matters. Well, let's um, let Scotland go you know, way. Democracy works at the size of the nation. It doesn't work at the size of 28 nations kind of well, trying to crunch yeah. together. It's too, it's too big. I mean, the United States is a country. It is. It is a country. Just like Soviet Union. Historic, historically, it is. It is a country. 
Um, but the European Union is 28 different nations. But why, why do you defer to history? Because to me, history, history only means something in what we can learn from it, right? Uh, things shouldn't exist just because they historically did. Okay, that, that, because otherwise okay, we'd still have slavery. Otherwise we'd say slavery is great because we've always had it. N you know, this nation is great because it's always been there. Well, why can't we lose Scotland? Why can't we add another country? Why can't we just get a bit bigger, smaller? You, do you know, don't go by, don't let history dictate your, you, the, the way that you go forward. No, all, all, all I'm saying is that democracy works at, the, at, this, at this size, at the size of a, of a country, rather than trying to get 28 countries together. But, but actually, that's what we already do. I mean, literally, that's what goes on. So you have different trading blocks around the world who, who will be loosely arranged in other ways as well. We have the Commonwealth. We, we've car humans have carved up the globe in all the ways that are advantageous for them, right? And, and that's, that's what we do. So, so can we do that in a way that's advantageous for hu all humans? And can we do it in a way that's sustainable for the environment? And, and, I, and if you have countries that don't adhere to those blocks of countries, then they end up being able to do what they like. And that's why you can go and blow, you know, blow up or trawl fish or do this and do that, you know, and destroy the oceans that allow us to live. Now, unless you're going to get together, you can only morally obligate someone to do something if you have some kind of say in their democratic system, right, which is coming together with them. I, I mean, I do agree that we do need international cooperation on those things. So, I mean, I would want to see, you know, the EU as it's, con uh, as it's constituted dismantled and rebuilt, you know, in, in that kind of way. I because don't necessarily disagree. Okay, okay. Um, I mean, I think we want to talk about, you know, we can talk about immigration, we can talk about newspapers, but I'm wondering, Lynn, if uh, we ought to bring the audience in rather than us going hammer and tongs. <laughs> Okay, so we'll open it up, but um, um, I'll point out who can um, ask a question. You can only ask, only talk when you've got the mic, so we won't um, um, have any sort of argy-bargy going on. And because he's closest, I'll, if you'd like, Paul, we have your question. Take the mic. Thank you. I think you, you tend to overlook the fact that if you look at the principle, I say I live in a big house, and there are 28 neighbours all in their houses down the road. OK, chaps, we're all going to move into my house and live happily together. They've all got different customs, different religions, different ideas, different fi financial basis, different ways of operating business-wise and everything else. And I think it's a crackpot idea. And I can't see how it could possibly work. Uh, so uh, that's broadly about immigration, I take it, uh, which, um, so, well, a movement of people. Um, so yeah, I don't disagree necessarily. I think, I think freedom of movement is problematic, especially when you have established borders um, and, and there is a tension there and humans, humans and outsiders, we aren't very good with outsiders. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, moving is the basic human rights and, you know, all animals and all humans have moved over time. It's only actually since, relatively recently, like 300 years I think, since nationhoods really come in as an official thing. So when we started drawing lines in the sand and saying, you can't, you can't move here, that's a really, really recent thing. Actually, over the majority of human history, you could move and do that. And people did. And you know what? Our nation, our nation that you say, I don't want people to move in our house. The thing is, your house, you moved into it. I'm your ancestors. No, if we all moved into it, we could sure. and, and Absolutely. So, so I think there are pragmatic things that do need to be done about immigration or would need to be done if we had free movement of people around Europe unconstrained. However, We've had free movement of people in this country, and, and we are who we are, right? Vikings, Saxons, Danes, Angles, whatever. But, so, we have had that historically, and saying, no, we can't now, is interesting. Um, and it goes against what's gone before. But, pragmatically, um, I think I would agree that, that, actually, you can't just ignore that loads of people had an issue with immigration. You can't do that. Can, so can I, we need to do something yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to come in because I mean this is a key point here uh, about immigration. Uh, 
um, you said, Jonathan, that the referendum was really about immigration. Um, and I think for a lot of people it was. That probably was what, what swung the vote. Um, but what worries me about the way in which this is put across, not by you this evening, but by, by some people, is the idea that this was all basically about racism and xenophobia. And, and I don't think... I don't think it was about racism and xenophobia, although that, to some degree, there's an, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of um, stimulated the ugly side of, of that. Um, but I do think that, and it's probably agreeing with you, that um, I, would, I would say free movement of people has caused massive problems for working, you know, for working class people. And I don't, you know, and I do have sympathy with, um, with communities whereby, you know, they, they see people coming in um, by the hundred thousand and you know taking our jobs that kind of, that kind of rhetoric. But I do think that um, controlled immigration is is the right way forward. Free movement of people is absolutely crazy, and that's what's caused so much trouble in the European Union and that's what's driving, what, what, my claim is that it is driving xenophobia and fascism and right, and right, wing, and right wing fascism. I think it's really dangerous. Okay, a couple of things. In the short term it's driving that but of course after 50,000, 100,000 years of course you won't, that won't be a case. Like, no well, longer, that's, that's no a long, ludicrous no, argument. No longer do I rail against those pesky Vikings. Right? No, but, this, but, the, but I, actually they're in, they're in me. But that, that's a ludicrous extrapolation. No, it's not. It's because it's, it, it's, it's no. It's talking about teething problems of 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 large immigration. Yes, you will have that. But just but, for fifty thousand years. <laughs> Sorry. Just for fifty thousand. We just wait. Yeah, 50, yeah. We just wait fifty thousand years and it all pan out. Okay. Uh, shall we move on to an, another point? Um, okay. Now, okay. So, um, yeah. Perhaps, would you like to take? The, Lynn's the, taking the, control. Well done. Yes. Right. Enough, enough. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, just on that point there, um, in 2004 the EU did come out with a directive which allowed governments to um, control immigration, so we have absolute power of our immigration, it's just that consecutive governments have decided not to implement it, so the power has always been in the hands of ourselves, so we have had sovereignty there. Just, on, just wanted to make that point. Just on the other point where you're saying we can't hold the EU to account, um, obviously aware that we um, elect our MEPs and we have Theresa May sitting on the council of the EU, the EU council. So my point is, um, if we're not happy with the EU, potentially we're not happy with our MEPs and the person sitting on the council who represents us. Are you, so are you suggesting that maybe they haven't done a good enough job at EU level? I mean, because they are sitting there representing us. I acknowledge, I acknowledge that there is some democratic input into the European Union, exactly by what you've said, uh, MEPs and uh, Council of Ministers. But it, I just have to keep reiterating the point like a parrot, really. The, the European Union is, is not a democracy. I mean, because we can't change the direction. Fundamentally, we can't change the direction of the European Union. It doesn't have elections every five years whereby we can basically change the administration or the executive. It just keeps going on uh, on the basis of treaties. So it's, it's not a democracy, even though it has a little bit of democratic input. Just on that point, we didn't actually vote for Theresa May, but she's sitting on the council. So what's, what's, what's going on there then? Uh, well, that's just the way our, our system works, and I'm not. Ah, slightly broken democratic system. Well, I'm not. I'm not. But I'm not. I'm not claim. I'm not claiming that our system is perfect. Um, but 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 the, but then you know we don't have to vote. We we never vote for a prime minister in this country. We we vote for our MP. By the way, does does anyone so, not understand? Does anyone not know what the first past the post is? Put your hands up if you don't know what it is. Yeah, I don't know what you mean. Okay, only one, so I don't know if it's worth explaining. I'll do it really quickly. Um, so, if you had an, uh, an election here now for this constituency in this room, right, and you had 40% of people voted for David, 30% voted for that gentleman in orange, and 20% voted for me, right? He gets in, your 20% of votes would go for me aren't worth anything. So next constituency, same party as me, 20% only, uh, don't get in. Next constituency, 20%, oh, don't get in. 
all through the country that happens. You have 20% of all the voters in Britain voted for my party, the Awesome Party. Right? 20% of people in the whole of Britain voted for the Awesome Party. And because they didn't win in any given constituency, they have no MEPs. So the representation of 20% of the country does not exist. They are not represented in the dem democratically elected parliament, supposedly democratically elected parliament, running the country. Therefore, the government do not reflect the wishes of 20% of the people. And actually all the other people who didn't vote for David or his... <laughs> so other systems to deal with that are you get a second and third vote. So your preferences are taken into account. There are loads of other alternative voting systems, but the first pass of post is deeply undemocratic, and it's why the Liberal Democrats have fought for it for years, because they get something like, I can't remember, 20% of the vote, and they get something like 5% of the MPs every time. So I've just realised I've got a yellow mic. It's a Liberal Democrat yeah. mic. I shouldn't have it. But. <laughs> that, that's why. So first pass of post doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. It always does. Okay, um, another, another, another question at the back there, yes. Yeah, if we'd have AV now, we would have the, uh, the coalition with UKIP dictating our policy to whoever they'd form the uh, government with. That's a will so, of the people. So they're, they're, well, it's, it's not really because the vast majority of the people wouldn't want that. So that, that, that is the downside of, of uh, Proportional representation. I agree, it's a downside so, because you don't so I just like think, UKIP. Or if you've got a fascist party which holds a balance of power, and there's always a temptation for one of the two larger parties to have to cave in to what a more extreme party is saying. That's the, that's the well known downside. So mm. I think the whole argument about the representation is more nuanced than you're making out. I'd also ask you, Jonathan, who is the best uh, economist in The Guardian? <laughs> I would say it's Larry Elliott. He voted Leave and I, made arguments for that. I would that, say Chang, and, Haji Chang. Well, yeah. Okay, he's great as well. Uh, <laughs> but just the point, there's always been a left argument for leave. Yes, Cor yes. Corbyn, MacDonald, Tony Benn, we were always worried about sovereignty. Yeah. So I entirely agree with you that this election may have, or the referendum, we may have voted leave for the wrong reasons. But that doesn't mean when David puts forward good reasons, that they should be rubbish due to, oh. the, due to the inconsistencies in the situation Absolutely. as a whole. And finally, for the European Union now, they've got to become either a one-state federal democracy, or they're not going to function. The uh, quantitative easing is being wound down. Economists now think this is going to cause further problems in the European Union with the central bank has been the only institution that's been keeping the, uh, the European Union afloat. And so, you know, it's not going to remain as it is. It's either going to fall apart or it's going to have to move towards a federal state. And I don't think within Germany that the German people are prepared for that degree of fiscal transfer to, to the periphery. So whatever, there's no decent solution here. And no. I just think we need to have a more yeah. nuanced debate. Yes. I, that, I absolutely agree, actually, because I think... I think, and this is what I said to David before the debate, is that people are all or nothing. And, they, and what happens is they believe really strongly on one thing, and then they adopt all the other arguments, even though they don't really believe strongly about it, but they end up giving pretty weak arguments. And it's all or nothing. Whereas I will say something like, and I hope that's come across, which is immigration is an issue. It's an issue because people think it's an issue and believe it's an issue, therefore it's an issue. Um, uh, the, 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 economic, the economics of the EU are at times contradictory, but I think that can work in the long run. Um, and, and, and I have a nuanced approach. Uh, there are problems, but I prefer to fix them from within. Um, as far as v going into coalition with the UKIP, although I'm obviously not a big UKIP fan, um, if that's the will of the people, that's the power of democracy. You can't, on the one hand, say, ah, oh, we want democracy and the EU is rubbish with democracy, and then vote, four million people vote for the UKIP and say, well, I don't want them in coalition. But yeah, that's what they voted. Like, that's what we should have had. Now, I don't think we should have had it, like, as in, I didn't want it, but, but that's me. The UKIP voter did want it. Why does my opinion trump theirs? Okay. <laughs> Gosh, I have the mic. So many things to say, so little time. Um, I was going to make a point about democracy, but I'll spare you that. 
Uh, I think I'll make a point about currency. Uh, this has been in the context that I think our embedded relationship with Europe is part of our national resilience, and I think we throw it aside. Um, we should throw it aside with a great amount of caution. If we focus on currency, uh, David put up a chart, and what he actually showed, of course, was the deterioration of the sterling rate against the dollar from four dollars to the pound uh, before the Second World War down to 133 and a half today. And although you can make you can tell a lot of tales around that, it reflects, broadly speaking, Britain's declining importance in the world and our declining ability to trade and our declining ability to pay our way, which has been happening consistently uh, since 1900. Um, the question but, uh, Paul, I'm, I'm just want to butt in there because I mean we're still fifth or sixth largest economy in the world we're you know we're not a tiny little insignificant country that's absolutely true we have enormous wealth because we had years of slavery okay. and okay. industrial revolution and a valiant we're still in the top 10 history we are in the top 10 that's not my point um, if we come to currency you, you did make a, a you, you, you were quite forceful in explaining the significance of a fiat currency. And I absolutely agree with you, it, it's a lot more flexibility within certain tolerances. But I would say in passing that probably the Argentinian peso and the Venezuelan Bolivar are probably also fiat currencies. And although you may be able to print as much money as you like, in extremis you certainly can't buy what you want with it. Uh, and I think I will we'll try and come to the point. When the vote took place, uh, our currency, the trade rate of depreciation, fell by 10%, 12%, 14% at different times. And for the first full year... Are you that, talking about post-Brexit? Yes. Okay. And the first full year that that was in effect, it cost our economy 50 to 60 billion pounds, and that manifested in 3% inflation, and that made all of us with money assets in this country worse off. And what I would say to you is, we have been warned. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I, know, I know that Steve wants to come in on that. On, on sterling depreciation. I mean, I'll just say briefly that I'm with Steve on this, that, you know, sterling needs to go down a lot further so that we can have uh, competitive manufacturing. Okay, okay, well... Can I, okay. can I add to that as well, that Mark Carney's just come out and said we're also £40 yeah. billion uh, pounds worse off the GDP, costing each family £900. Um, so, so actually, you know, we are being warned and things are, I mean, I think we, I think Brexit loses the economic argument. I don't think that's, that, I think that's a given. So I think for, for Brexiteers to try the economic argument, well, it depends how you see economics, right? If you see economic growth, we are going to be hit big time economically. So I think it, it's better off going down other ways. Well, I mean... <laughs> We haven't got all night to, to challenge that claim, but I, I would just challenge that claim, you know, because that's just a, I know, it's just a statement speaking, yeah. that you've made. Can, can, I, I, can, I, I, just, um, can I just briefly... Can I just answer one thing he did say, which yeah. is we are the sixth biggest, and he didn't hint at this, sixth or eighth now biggest economy in the world, largely due to the Industrial Revolution, which is driven by protectionism and the use of our colonies and, and nicking all the resources. So, don't... I would be really wary about saying how wonderful we are, because we are wonderful on the back of being a, of a colonial imperialistic state that went around the world sticking flags in countries and using their resources and then making protectionist rules that stopped India competing. So we nick their stuff and then stop them competing with us. So that's not the way that just be born. Yeah. That's not the way trade is going to work in the future. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, John, uh, a lot of David's argument was about neoliberalism and, uh, you know, the economic <laughs> argument. Um, I don't think you really have addressed that at all. You've said that, uh, that there are some protections, which is true in the European <coughs> Union, um, but what you haven't addressed is the devastation that uh, David pointed to that's happened to Greece and Southern, uh, Southern Europe generally. Uh, the huge unemployment and so on. I mean, I speak as a 
someone who voted Remain, but yeah. I think that those arguments are very strong and they yeah, do need to be addressed. Yeah. Well, this is what I say about having a nuanced approach, is that the, the EU handled Greece really badly. <laughs> Just like our government is handling austerity really badly. You know, democratic organisations still aren't, don't do the perfect things all the time. And the EU will have made bad decisions and done bad things. Like Britain has done bad things. And we presently are still doing bad things, politically speaking, in my opinion. So, yes, I think we could have dealt with Greece a lot better. And I think Germany had a part to play in, in, uh, and, and the bank, central bank in the... the, the the horrors that happen in Greece. But that's that. Sorry, Jonathan. But that's that's the way the the EU operates. I mean, you've got people like um, Mario Draghi, the uh, uh, the chief executive of all areas of the European Central Bank. The people who are in charge are neoliberals, and they're never going to let countries like Greece democratically uh, change the system under which they've been ruined. So, I mean, it, it's, it, you know, when people say, oh, well, it's not perfect, it's, I mean, that, I find that incredibly, well, not personally insulting, but it, it's, it's insulting in the sense that to say it's not perfect, it's been absolutely catastrophic, the way the, the, way the European Union, well, I think and, and the fact that the, the euro means that countries do not have that um, safety valve of their own currency anymore. Sure, we didn't have the euro, by the way, so just the, on, on our leaving Brexit... It that's, was a that's, close run thing. Yeah, but we, we didn't have it. But I, I just think it's interesting that, that, that yes, that, that was a pretty catastrophic thing that happened to Greece. However... But it's not, let's, let's it's not in the past, but it's still... It's I still know, if you think on. the EU isn't going to learn things from that, if you think the EU will let that happen again, they will just fall apart. When you said... It's carrying still, on. It's happening. just carrying on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when, you said, when you said, you know, the EU will fall apart, the EU will fall apart largely because we've left it and now we're giving it some permission for other people to do so. so. It will fall do, you, do, you, do you think? Do you think the E? It will fall apart because it can't go forwards and it can't go backwards. It's actually yeah. stuck in limbo and it's actually in stagnation and in, in, in an ongoing Great Depression. Yeah. Okay. Well, why is it? Well, you need to justify that. Okay. So it why? can't. It can't go forward to federal union, which was what um, a current a, a common currency needs. It can't do that anymore because there's too much anti-EU sentiment. It can't go backwards, which is what it kind of needs to do. It needs to actually, the, the euro needs to be dismantled. I mean, effectively, that's what's going to have to happen. It will do whatever it needs to do to survive. That's the nature of anything, right? Otherwise, it won't survive. But, you so know, but when, yeah, but, okay, but when the euro is dismantled, to be honest, that is the end of the, the European dream, the European project, as it was conceived by the founders and by people like Delors. Okay, so leap, leaping in quickly, but my mum is trying to um, seize the microphone from me, but uh, I'm, I'm resisting for a second. <laughs> um, as a, a, a sort of aspiring internationalist, I was very disappointed at the uh, narrow Brexit vote. I quite agree about the media bias that by the billionaires and the dodgy UKIP financiers. But uh, a very quick question for each of you, you know, in terms of the issues, you know, just sort of short stuff. I mean, for David, can you be sort of hand on heart that will never be in the future another European war? Because that's all our all our history up to now. And you're saying, oh, it's a utopian project. Well, it's worked so far. The European Union. No, but there's right. a question on the other side as well, which is, I'm sort of sneaking in too, uh, and for Steve, I mean, is the Euro sustainable? Is it sustainable? So it's those two questions. Okay. I mean, I, I, I said in my in my speech, Simon, that the European Union is highly dangerous for the future of Europe. It's the European Union uh, with, with its uh, neoliberal ideology, which is which has created permanent austerity in certainly in, in states like like Greece and, and southern southern countries. That is what is stoking xenophobia and fascism. That's why you've got Nazis in the Greek parliament. Um, so it's the European Union which is bringing that, that um, you know, the, the, the danger is actually closer to hand. That's like saying the Jews empowered the Nazis. What do, what do you mean? Well, you can't say that 
um, the EU is, um, is well, I'd love to talk that, sorry, but I mean... Really, you disagree with me, Phil. Do? Okay, yes. that's fine. <laughs> I, I was going to bring this in earlier, actually, which is, you, you talk about, oh, it's terrible about Greece and this and that, and, and yes, that, that there are some, some really s sticky wickets, but... Don't forget that we've had the longest period of international history, uh, peace in history. Mm -hmm. like, don't forget that the absolutely incredible things that you should not, we should not take for granted in that the amount of international peace in the EU is unknown of in the history of humanity. Right? That, that is, you know, might not sound good and, and you know, there might be mistakes that get made and, and, and the, the Eurozone might be up against it, it economically and, and structurally, but, but perhaps that's a price worth, price worth paying for the saving of human life, I don't know, but we are experiencing well, a great period of Correlation is not causation, as you know, but so we can, we can argue, we'd have to argue that point. So. Well, cool. <laughs> Um, Simon had a question for you about the euro. Perhaps you want to answer that. Is it sustainable? Oh no, no I said yeah. But perhaps there needs to be some structural changes. Okay, and certainly, okay. I think you know uh, the the challenges to the to the EU as it will be going forward will be uh, the eurozone and how and 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 Greece. I think those those are and how how the EU deals with with some of the smaller nations in power and and um, and population and and with the economics when it go when it goes wrong so yeah i think well, i think there's work to be done <laughs> okay. so the um the referendum ended with quite quite a close result with only a one one point eight percent um victory for for leave and the um, vote leave team thanks cambridge analytica for the, their help um, in using data mining to find out which of potential voters would be would be on the fence. They don't really know which way to vote because they're uninformed or they, they, they don't care. And um, which people would be most likely to be swayed by an advert telling them to vote leave. So they, they got to spend their budget on only advertising to people that had a, quite a high chance of being converted. And they broke funding rules. Yeah. They did do that. But I, although I'm... I think I think it is quite concerning that um, that companies that are able to do this can sway the results of votes, not only in England but also the American vote for Donald Trump, um, using the same company. Actually, I, I think it's quite concerning for. Uh, I, I think it's also worse because the, the gap the the gap between Leave and Remain is also, for most polls that have been done. The people who have changed their mind is now bigger than that gap. So the polling in North Northern Ireland this week has found a 13% swing to remain. So it's now 69% remain. So, you know, I, the idea that we can't change our minds. So if I said to you, right, can you go and buy some bro broccoli from One Stop? And you say, you've got, I've got, you've got two choices. You can either walk to One Stop or you can drive to One Stop. And I say, it's a nice it's a sunny day, blah, 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 and, I, and I sell you this. And you go, yeah, I'm going to walk to One Stop. And then I say, Oh, thanks for that decision. By the way, I didn't tell you because we didn't know at the time, but now we know that you've got an 80% chance of being mugged when you when you walk to one stop. You go, uh, but but unfortunately, you've made your choice now, so you know off you go. No, you can't change your mind. This idea that we can't change our minds or we can't have another referendum because we've had one and that's it. I find it really odd because do you know what? I change my mind all the time, especially when I'm given more information. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I, I want to I want to respond to no. Hang on, Paul. I want to respond to Dan, and then I'll just briefly respond to that. Um, I'm I'm slightly concerned with the implication that you know one or two adverts you know can actually sway these these kind of voters. Um, I mean, this is this is a broader problem with democracy in the sense that. Um, you know, it's very easy. I mean, I think it's actually very easy to get good, imp good quality information during the campaign. In fact, um, I I don't think 
there was any reason for anyone to take any notice of the campaigns at all on either side because we know that campaigns are pure propaganda. Just completely disregard them. Get the information and then make an educated, um, uh, then make, uh, vote in an educated manner. I know that I'm, I know that I'm actually sort of preaching this ideal of democracy, but that's partly why I, I'm passionate about running Dorset Humanist. At least we had a public debate on the subject, and at least we tried to inform people. So I do think there is a problem, there is a real problem with the ignorance of the British public. I do agree that there are problems with newspapers, but this is why I say to people, don't read newspapers, don't read any newspapers, don't read The Guardian either, because all newspapers are just propaganda sheets. Well, that's very idealistic, but the biggest discriminator between those who voted remain and those who voted was university education. <coughs> That's the single biggest discriminator. And your point and is what, well, Phil? That, that they're not able to make the vast majority. I mean, yeah. by definition, 50% of the okay. population of okay. the European to me have an IQ of an estimate. But if, but if it, it, yeah, okay. okay. But, if it, but, but if it just comes down to that one thing that those, that those let's say those ignorant people, if they, if they only understand one thing, which is the effect that free movement of people has had on their, on devastating their, their communities and their economies, I think that's a legitimate reason. And that, and that predates the campaign by decades, or years at least, anyway. Yes, but more than 50. Can we have the mic? Mic, mic only. Sorry? Can we have the mic rule? The mic rule. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, come on, come on, chair. Yes, mic rule. Yeah, yeah. Nothing to do with democracy. I've got the mic. Yeah. Don't worry. So, um, yeah, hi, Jonathan. Um, I got um, a, a, a sort of concern with the, uh, the sort of claim that anything that's happened since we've joined the EU, such as the peace within Europe or um, feces-free beaches throughout the country, can all be put down to the uh, European as a cause. Um, Stephen Pink has said in quite a few books, uh, sort of quite uh, demonstrably, how every nation on earth um, has seen a massive reduction in inter-nation violence, um, and some of them have got no connection to Europe at all. Um, if we took the thought experiment, if we weren't part of, um, let's say Europe hadn't happened as a project, could you genuinely say that we would be at war now within Europe? It's, it's, um, we, we just, the, the point is we can't, we can't, um, you can't say that we, um, we wouldn't be, but you, you can't put, um, piece down to, um, European, laws and that many nations on earth are also um, been bringing in much greater environmental control um, that aren't part of the europe since the 70s and their beaches are clearer as well so it's it's uh, fallacious to uh, do the cause co uh, the correlation and uh, the cause well actually i don't i disagree there because we literally were polluting stuff we had smog we were we were not putting in in legislation, and the EU came along, and we enacted them. Ha hang on, but but what's what's even more so? So, in 2013, George Osborne wanted us to take be taken out of the um, uh, the habitats and birds directives. Lo he wanted us taken out out of, and we were still in the fully in the EU. The referendum wasn't even on the cards. He wanted us taken out of so much um, environmental legislation. So, so, so I, I actually I disagree with it because the evidence is pretty clear. We were polluting, we joined the EU, the EU made a bunch of rules that said we couldn't pollute and we'd be fine if we did, and we cleaned up our act to, to go in line with that. And then when, when we got everything cleaned up, we wanted to save money and cut regulation and attract businesses to our shore, he wanted us to, to deregulate, and but he didn't get that through. So. I'd, I would disagree on that. Well, you've, got to, well, you've got to compare against the other states, nation states, and if you look at the graphs of the environmental improvements, they're there whether you're in the EU or not. Yeah. 
Yeah. And that's the same for the piece of war, which you didn't know. So, so it, you're, you're, you're making claims about other nations, of course. So, for, so the environment, let's take the environment of a sub South American country, North American country, Australasia. The, the environmental controls have improved in all... So let, let's look at, say, uh, the Amazon rainforest in South America, which has been destroyed. Let's look at um, oil pipelines in Venezuela. Let's look at... I mean, I would just disagree with you all no, well, entirely on those claims. That's, 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 that's anecdotal, isn't it? Well, so, so is your claim. Your claim. You're making claims. Look at these other nations. Their environment's brilliant, and yet you're not giving me any citations or any. Okay. The, 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 the Clean Air Act of 1996. Uh, uh, hang on. No, we, we need we need Sorry, to no, stick to the mic so room many, because so, um, people can't hear you, unfortunately. Sorry, so. Okay. Yeah, really. so well. okay. Thank you. Okay. 1956. We didn't join the EU until 1973. That's that's not to say we can't make legislation in the history of British democracy. Democracy to, for the good of our nation. The, we, do you know why we didn't make that vote? We didn't make it because it was a morally right thing to do. We made it because we were living in smog and people were dying. Right? That isn't a moral. That isn't a moral led piece of legislation. That is not morally led. That's that is to say, w pragmatically, if we don't do this, then we're going to be spending money on the NHS. We're going to be spending. You, know, you can't do work. We'll lose work days. Blah blah blah. So I I, I would actually call that into defence from my point. A man moved out of the cave into the 21st century and every civilised nation like Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the rest of the list. But those aren't my points. Greece, Portugal and Ireland had to fall down before the EU would do anything and then did nothing and would just say we're going to go on this course if you're not keeping up then you just fall behind and away they walked. Peace in Europe. Thank God for NATO if I could use the God word. Sorry Lynn. Um, so yes NATO was the case there. If the EU wasn't there NATO would have still kept us together and will continue to do so. 651 votes in the EU house. We have 71. If this room now was the EU chamber and you were France and you were Germany you would outvote us on every decision that all the 28 people here ever wished to make. We only have one vote in the, in the parliament here for, for living here, so I, that doesn't really matter. We do, it's but David's covered those points. Of course that, that's the case, it's representative of geography. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying, that if everybody in, in right. the UK wanted to vote, and of course we don't because some vote Lib Dem, Conservative, Labour, those, but those, if we all stuck together, we still couldn't outvote anybody else in Europe. Though, yeah, but we can't outvote anyone in, in our House of Commons now with what we believe in Bournemouth. That, that's exactly the point. It's geographically representative, and the amount of MEPs are represented by the size of the, the size of the countries dictate the amount of MEPs. So I absolutely agree. You, that's right, and that's democracy. But in the same way that Scotland can never outvote the rest of the UK, no matter what they say, no, they there are fewer together, people there. They never. Well, I think. Scotland but actually, actually, oh. <laughs> Got the, excited. Right, the, the SNP and Scotland, due to first past the post, has the lowest number of, of votes per MP in the whole of Britain. So Scotland is a great example of democracy going wrong. There are 56,000 people per vote, right? Per, sorry, per, per MP. 56,000. UKIP, 4 million per vote. That's how broken our system is. So thank you, I agree. Well, uh, that was my next point actually. The AV vote I actually voted for, but once we had the coalition government, I, I'm back with Steve that I wouldn't want to go with that, that route now because if you have to compromise on every vote, you never get one party in charge. And that coalition government is one of the most successful in history for making decisions. And your, your big point on democracy, you said about the choice to leave the EU, that if we leave the EU, other countries might follow. Why not give them the choice? I'm, I'm not, not giving them the choice. You, you, you said it would be disastrous if other countries also left after us. It would be disastrous for the EU. Well, yes. But if that's the choice of the people, that's the choice of the people. Yes, it is. Yeah. Thank <laughs> <laughs> on, on a personal note, um, in 1975, I married a lady called the EEC. And with, <laughs> and with many marriages, people change over time. I filed for divorce because this lady became the EU. And uh, I filed for divorce two years ago. And I really think we should just get on with it. And I think that's a real issue that nobody under 50 actually quite understands. Yeah. We were conned. Yeah. Can, I, can, I, can, I just, can I just agree with you there? Because this referendum is long overdue. I mean, we should have had it soon after the 1992 Maastricht Treaty, because that's, that's when the EEC, as you said, changed into a quasi-state. Um, and 
you know, people say, oh, we shouldn't have referendums. Yes, we should have referendums based on national destiny, especially when the arguments cut across parties and cut through parties. That's why we have referendums. They should be used sparingly. But uh, the first referendum, I was too young to vote. I remember it in 1975. I was pro-EU at the time. My mum was saying, oh no, we shouldn't, shouldn't go into Europe. And she was sort of pro um, Enoch Powell, blah, blah, blah. We would say, oh no, we, you know, we, we ought to go into Europe. So I was pro-Europe at the time, but I was too young to vote. It's taken until I'm nearly 60 years old to have my once in a lifetime vote on the European Union. I'm, and I'm very grateful, whatever the circumstances of that uh, were in the, in the Conservative Party and why David Cameron decided to agree on a referendum. Whatever the circumstances were, I'm very, very grateful from a democratic point of view that I've had a once-in-a-lifetime chance to vote on this subject or, or this, uh, this topic of national destiny. And you're right that, you know, it's, it's long overdue. If we had another one, you'd have two well, we can't. Yeah, okay. I mean, I'll just, just. I mean, I'll just briefly. Answer, all the joy. I'll just briefly answer that. And I mean, I could say, oh no, we can't have another one because it might go the other way. Um, but, but I would only say, I would only say that you know, when we have these these really fundamental, I don't think it was handled well. I, I mean, they do it much better in Switzerland because they have referendums all the time, and their electorate is much much better informed. It was it was very poorly handled. I do agree with that. Um, but we can't keep having them. You know, we it was it was put to the British people. This is your choice, in or out. Uh, they didn't say, oh, well, let's have a vote in 2016, see how it goes, maybe we'll have another, maybe we'll have a few more, you know, pick the best of three, something like that. Uh, you can't do it on that basis. Why, why, it's just why not? If it, if, it, if it was set out to be advisory... It's, it's too disrupt it's, it's it's disruptive out, enough. It's set out, it was set out to be advisory. We made a vote. A large amount of people, by their own admission, did it as a protest vote and didn't know. I researched a lot about the EU. I was in a debate here. I still don't think I knew or know enough about the EU to make a properly informed decision about whether to be in or out. Right? But we've had so, 40 years to think about it. Yeah, but, but it's so complex. I've also got 40 years to live my life and learn about other things. So I know, I know. Well, the, the point being is that, that if I'm then introduced to more information, as, as, as a, an individual or as an electorate, which I think is happening, what, what happened is we were asked in or out of the EU. So if I said, exactly as this gentleman, go, go to one stop by walking or by car, right? That's it. If that's your option, in or out, then we're in. What if I then said, well, if you vote in, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, or if you vote out, this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. That changes my decision. But because we weren't given that, and that wasn't part of the question, and we weren't given a vision of what out would be, I think the whole idea of the referendum was broken. I think it was not only poorly managed from a macro scale, but the question and the way it was framed was really, really simplistic, which meant that the answer, the vote, became really simplistic. We made a decision. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you've got a football no, team. Paul, 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 Paul. Let but, this man take him but if, but okay, this is no, sorry. If this is a good point, because if the if the matches are friendly, then I play them again, right? Yeah, I would play them because it's a friendly. I can play. I can. I manage a football team. I can. I can. I can play a friendly as many times as I like because it doesn't really mean much. It's informing me of how good my team is and what I need to do in order to affect the future of my team. So that's a friendly. That is what this was. It was an advisory referendum. If I then go to a league match or a cup final and I say, this is it, right? If you lose this, you get the cup, or you don't get the cup. And if you win it, you get the cup. Then fair enough. That's fine. That's a proper proper football match. Uh, but I, if it's I, advisory... Yeah. Can I, can I do, I, I mean, there's so many points I could make. I just want to make the point that an advisory referendum is actually a contradiction in terms. You either have a referendum or you don't. Yeah. 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 I don't necessarily disagree, well, don't call it an advisory referendum. Well, because it was to advise sure. the, the, the sure. representatives of the, the feeling. It shouldn't have been called that. It's okay, ridiculous. can I move on because we're sort of running out of time? So just um, a few more. Um, it's obviously very easy to sort of 
is rubbish what's currently happening and how awful it is. But the question is, is the alternative any better and how will Brexit benefit you and us? Good news. I'm not sure we got, got time. But no, but that's All right, a I'll... question not to be avoided, isn't it? Okay. How will we be better off outside of the EU? Ah, uh, okay. Um, food, low tax haven. Food, food, food prices will go down immediately as soon as we come out of the customs union because the customs union is a protectionist area. It's a basically a protectionist zone. Um, I will also I would also say that small and medium-sized businesses will thrive because they won't have to abide by all of the EU um, regulations which are inappropriate to those businesses. I'm not arguing no, hang on I'm not arguing against all regulation. I'm saying that we shouldn't the EU shouldn't impose all of this regulation on all, all companies. So our small businesses will thrive. Um, we will be able to do trade deals around the world much more easily than the European Union. The European Union has taken 27 years to try and have a free trade agreement with America and it still can't do it because it's too cumbersome and it has too many countries. And we will be able to um, we will be able to conclude free trade deals very easily on our own. So I've just given you three three answers to that question. Jonathan, um, on that before I, we move I remember on. getting a job before I became a teacher for a, a large corporation, and uh, they made me sign out of EU work, working rights legislation. And I just thought that's a really good piece of legislation, and and. I'm, I'm being forced by my corporation to sign out that, and I was dead against that. Uh, and that's not uh, that's us allowing loopholes in legislation, but it means that my working rights were being a, were, were being downgraded. Now, if we came out of the EU, we wouldn't have that at all. And it's interesting that Aaron said about um, Canada and Australia in terms of environment. I don't think you realise that Canada and Australia have terrible environmental um, histories. They are. Australia per head of capita is one of the worst polluters in the world and Canada under Harper for the last two election cycles before Trudeau was absolutely, I've got goosebumps, was absolutely <laughs> terrible, terrible for the environment, destroying pipelines, oil, um, CO2, like, so it's really interesting when you pick certain countries as if like, I know about those things, but most people would just take, oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, what about those countries? Those countries, because they don't have to adhere to framework legislation, can do what the hell they like. And what happens when countries do what they like? They go to attract businesses. How do they attract businesses? They lower regulation. They lower cost of labour. They lower um, uh, employment rights. And what happens in Australia and, and Canada is a great example of countries not having to abide by a moral framework. Um, sorry, first of all, just to say that I think both speakers are um, very well informed and very eloquent and certainly better informed than me. Um, just really wanted to take an issue with something that you uh, alluded to, one of which was uh, Jonathan's comment about from Churchill. Yeah. Do you want to give, do you want to give him your yeah. mic? Yeah. So one of which is the, uh, the comment about uh, speaking to the British electorate by Churchill. Uh, and the other was about um, David's point about you know, researching in the, uh, the, the press and so on before the, the actual referendum. I think uh, an awful... Uh, an awfully large percentage of the people who voted uh, for, for exiting uh, got all their information from the side of a bus. Mm. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I get... Okay. Is this on? Is this working? Yeah, okay. Shall I? I'll, do, I'll just respond quickly to that, Mike. I mean, I still come back to this idea that, um, I mean, in a democracy, all voters, all citizens, do have a duty to inform themselves as well as possible, you know. Um, but I would also say that um, the the British people have had a long time to think about this. It, it wasn't just 
the campaigns that what done it. You know, we've been we've been promised. You know, Tony Blair promised a referendum on the European Union. Um, you know, years before we actually had one. This is long overdue. The the, the British people, even if it does come down to a couple of issues like. Um, free movement of people and, and the idea of sovereignty even if it does come down to those a, cu a couple of simple issues that, that, is, that is their democratic right to reduce it to those um, to, to those a small well just a couple of issues rather than saying oh everyone needs a kind of master's degree to, to be able to say whether it's going to be good or bad economically the economists don't know whether it's going to be good or bad economically. But, you know, there's, there's loads of different views on that. Um, so, you know, all I would say is it, it was democratically legitimate because we've had a long time to think about this. That would be my view. My, my point is neither going to support or, um, con you know, go against uh, Brexit. But it's interesting, that talking about neoliberalism, so Milton Friedman, who you mentioned, one of the, the core components of neoliberalism is that consumers make all the decisions, right? So consumers in capitalism are the ones who arbitrate for everything because they demand things. And it, this is based on this idea called homo... Um, no, uh, Homo economicus. So Homo economicus, which is what Milton Friedman, the Chicago boys sort of espouse, which is the idea that humans make rational choices. Now, uh, people like Daniel Kahneman came along uh, and won a Nobel Prize for economics for showing that humans really don't make rational decisions. In fact, our decisions are very bad very often. And we post hoc rationalise and we do this and do, you know, those terms post hoc rationalisation, I mean, that's a core stuff of Daniel Kahneman. So, uh, when it comes to things like this, we will make decisions based on emotion and then we'll post hoc rationalise reason, rational reasons afterwards, but really what's driving our decisions is emotion, which you can tell when, he, when David says something that people like here, they clap him, because it's like he's reinforcing my opinion. When I say something you guys like, uh, you clap me. And all this is, we become tribal and all this is, is just psychology. And, and, and who best would, would be able to manipulate psychology. When you're talking about keeping a status quo, that's quite difficult to argue for. So Remain had it quite difficult. Leave could play, play, on, play on fear. They could play on a, a brave heart. We could be free, we could be great, and this could all be wonderful. Um, and I think it was an easy win, really, for Leave, and I think it was a really difficult task for Remain, especially when you take into account psychology. But Remain, Remain was based on fear as well. But... Yes, yeah, yeah, and that's absolutely true. So they're based on economic fear. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, interestingly, appears, because people, people claim that, oh, they blew it all out of proportion, and uh, we haven't left yet, right? So the economic doom and gloom could well happen still, and in fact, according to Mark Carney and, and our movement of our economy and the sluggishness that we have, appears to be happening. Okay, well, I think we really must stop it there because we've gone over time as well. But it is <coughs> very much indeed. resolve this issue of and I just wondered if perhaps if all the chaps take their shirts off and we have a sort of mass wrestle and we see whoever wins yes yeah Aaron's starting the thing and um, we can decide audible. on that basis I think it's as good as any don't yeah, you yes thank you, you. <laughs> 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 yes thank you yes thank you yes yeah well we can just watch we can watch okay I'll move on we have a show of <laughs> oh, oh, Aaron wants to. Wants oh, to well, right. what, how are we going to frame this sort of? Uh, um, <laughs> so optimistic or pessimistic? Is that is that the way we want to frame it? Right. Okay. We're going to put your hands up if you're optimistic about Brexit or you're pessimistic. So hands up, op optimistic about Brexit, going after Brexit. Okay. Um, um, and now, um, uh, pessimistic about Brexit. Oh. <laughs> we'll find out in 50,000 years time. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, we've, we've just got a few notices. Well,